I'm going to talk about a very difficult subject. It's called free will. Most people believe that they have free will. A uh, strange thing about it, in the mechanical world, when uh, they say the machine turned off, machines don't turn off. Either there's a short or something wrong with the circuit. And even automobile mechanics look for the factors that change the behavior of the automobile. Either the tires are not equally inflated, they look for that. If your car veers to the right or left, sometimes the tire pressure isn't even in your car. Sometimes a lawnmower doesn't cut the grass, the blades aren't sharp enough, or the RPM is not great enough, the rotational speed. So they always look for events that are responsible for the behavior of all mechanical systems. In fact, if you made a blade of a fan and had no pitch, it would turn, but it wouldn't blow wind. So it's the pitch that blows the wind. And of course, the pitch moves the air and then blows the wind. Uh, so we all look for even a, a wind turbine is turned by the pitch, but wind has to act on it to do that. Now moisture rises off the earth. We say the moisture is rising. Actually the sun evaporates it. The sun lifts these little drops by heating them and they move up and back rapidly and they rise. They rise. Actually they are caused to rise by the sun acting on the drops of water. We equate everything in nature. We never see well, some of us do. We say the tree fell over. The tree doesn't fall over unless it happens to have branches which grow and change the center of gravity of the tree. So it can no longer, the roots are not, do not grasp enough surface to keep the tree upright. So the wind acting, acting on the tree makes it fall to the ground. It isn't just the wind, it's gravity an asymmetry of balance which causes that. But human beings feel that they themselves have free will. They make choices. And free will means that all choices are made without cause. And if something is caused by something else, it's not free will. In other words, hunger, when you get hungry, the organism has used a lot, a lot of energy, and so you have different feelings. You have thirst, you have hunger. It's thirst, it, and it tends to make you want a glass of water. If you never had the feeling of thirst, you'd dry up, you would die. If you didn't have a sensor, if a fly landed on you, if you didn't feel the itch, it would sting you continuously. So would it be. But the fact that you have sensory things, meaning responding mechanisms, you whack the fly. So if all things in nature are subject to natural force, including the orbit of the moon around the earth, is a gravitational field that keeps the moon within the orbit, the same with the earth, the same with the earth rotation, is done by physical force, something in nature that does that. A magnet really does not attract other material, but there's some mechanism in the magnet that acts in a certain way. In other words, they found out years ago that if you suspend the ball with a string near a precipice, it moves toward the precipice. Mass seems to attract mass, certain kinds of mass. So if you suspend a ball near a cliff, it moves a little bit toward the cliff. Now, what that mechanism is, I can go into theories about that, but I don't want to do that now, because it wouldn't serve any useful purpose. If an airplane is about to take off, and there's a sudden gust of wind, it'll take off faster. And if it's about to come in for landing and the wind moves at the speed the airplane's moving, it'll drop to the ground. It needs wind coming at it to sustain it. 
Also, man does not see with his eyes. He needs light. If a man says, well, at least I can see, if you bring him into a dark closet and tell him to see, he cannot, unless there's light. So he does not see with his eyes. He sees with a combination of the retina, the brain, the eyes, and light, and many other factors, which I needn't go into. If all things are acted upon by nature, if a moth has a tendency to fly into light, and the moth has what we call an antenna, it's a heat sensor, and when he gets near the flame, the heat sensor lets him know, gives him a reaction away from the flame. So a moth without an antenna would fly into fire. It's the antenna that caused him to back off. If you put sensors on a machine, meaning if they can sense the environment, they can react to it. Without sensors, a blind man needs a cane to see if there's objects in front of him because he doesn't have visual senses. They say he tripped over the object. You know, he had no senses to tell him there was an object on the floor that he could not sense. So if a doctor knows that, that you have damaged senses, they recommend eyeglasses or eye surgery or retinal damage replacement or hearing aids. If you lose your hearing, you can't hear a Mack truck coming down the street. You have to step in front. If you can hear, at least you got another sensor that tells you there's a vehicle coming. So people that are deaf have a higher chance of being hit by a car. Not because they're deaf, because they can't sense a car coming down the street. So when we talk, they used to in the old days say we have six senses, like we had six. We have an internal sense of how full you are, you have a pain sense of the depth of your body, you have an itch sense, you have a burn sense, you have many different senses, not six. Whenever you say, you can say, we have six senses that I'm aware of, but you can't say we have six senses. You have a sense of fullness sometimes, a sense of fatigue, which they don't talk about. So, so don't try to numerically unless you do a study of everything you react to and you say, this is a list of everything that I find that man can react to. Some people, some, very few, can sense magnetic fields. Some birds can't. If you put a magnet, connect a magnet to their head, they lose sense of direction. The same with fish. So fish have senses we don't have. I'm not talking about good, bad, or right, or wrong. I'm just talking about what you react with. So if a light gets continuously brighter and brighter, your eyelids will come down. And if it gets so bright, you'll put your hand in front to diminish the light. They say, I put my hand there to diminish the light. Even if they couldn't speak, they'd do that. You know what I mean? They don't have to be able to speak. So people think that they choose things. The proof that they don't choose things is many, but I'll give some. If you're brought up in a tribe that looks very different than we do, you fall in love with that configuration. That's why when I say there's no such thing as beauty, it's a conditioned thing. You're conditioned to like girls that are blonde or redhead depending on the movies, the books, the people you've known. So we don't always know what it is that makes us appear to choose. But if you met a person with, with yellow spots on their face and they always beat you up every time you met a person with yellow spots, the next time you saw a person with yellow spots, you'd cross the street. And they say, well, I'm avoiding the person with the yellow spots. No, that's called a condition reflex. You're conditioned to react to yellow spots. It doesn't mean that everybody with yellow spots will beat you up. We project, and maybe some of that projection is useful for survival. So if you eat a certain type of grass and you get a bellyache, 
the next time you see that pattern, you tell somebody else, don't eat that. Because all your decision-making is based upon experience. So if you touch a lot of poison oak and you get blisters on your hand and you don't know what it is that you touch, you better make a record in the future of touching things and then looking at your hand. And then later when you get a reaction, your decision-making system is affected by the rash you get. So if you meet a redhead and she's very temperamental, and you meet a second redhead and she's very temperamental, you might tell your friends, stay away from redheads. They're temperamental. No, that's your reaction to particular redheads. So if you meet a gay person and they reach for you, you put your hand there, what the hell's the matter with that person? They've been conditioned differently than you have. It isn't that they're bad. Nobody is bad. So that's why society does not believe in free will. They say, don't steal. When the kid steals, you slap his hand, if you catch him stealing. If you don't catch him, he can get away with it. So you tell kids, you give them a sense of morality, a sense of behavior, by spanking or pulling a dog. All dogs will try to, be, try to do whatever they want to do. So you connect the leash to him. When he tries to do his own thing, you pull him away. So he always has to obey you. But if you let a dog alone, he'll take over. A dog will always try to get you to do things to satisfy it, unless you dominate the dog. The same with people. If a guy says to a small guy, go get me a glass of water, and the small guy doesn't, and he slaps him. The next time he says, get me a glass of water, small guy, get him a glass of water. But he's a big guy, and he picks him up and throws him across the room. He never says, he says, I'll get my own glass of water. That's based on conditioning. So free will is an arrogance on the part of man. The assumption that he is the only object in the world that does not react to certain stimuli. All decisions are based upon whatever reaction you had. If you like a young lady, you get married. In the old days, you just moved in together. But it was too difficult to manage. That is, a ruling group of people could not manage people unless they made a set of laws and said, you don't take anything out of his hut, you don't take anything out of her hut. They had to invent some kind of structure to keep that society from working. In other words, if everybody took things from your log cabin and you went hunting and you got five rabbits and I stole four of them, the tribe wouldn't work. So morality is an outgrowth of inability to manage systems. Do you understand that? All moral laws come about because we need to have, especially if you get more than four people living together, you have to make laws. The laws that don't take his bow and arrow, he made that bow and arrow. You, you give him all kinds of words, it's wrong, this is... Uh, but if a guy doesn't have a bow and arrow or a javelin and a lion comes at him and your javelin is nearby, he will borrow it. He doesn't steal it, he borrows it and he throws it at the lion. Because that's the only thing he knows that'll keep the lion off. He said, I decided to take your javelin although I know it's yours, but there was nothing else I could do at the time. So the judge might be lenient. Now a lenient judge is a broad judge with broader experience. A judge that's brought up to believe in right, wrong, good, bad, black and white, his decisions are rigid as hell. But if he goes to another country that has a different set of values and he learns to live there, he can understand when you say, Different cultures impose different values on people. They don't care if you uh, were to take one grape from your grape collection. You had a lot of grapes on the table. But if you only had one grape, the law becomes severe. In scarcity, there are more laws. Can you understand that? The scarcer the object, the more laws. Now, if a man is incapacitated, he has scarcity. So he looks at you that can walk up and down and jump. He envies you. 
because you have a wider range of behavior. But if he can be given a shot in the same range of behavior, he no longer envies you. So envy is a byproduct of behavior sometimes that you cannot perform. Do you understand that? Okay.